like and subscribe, and leave a comment below. Beyond Antarctica Chapter 19 Kim strides onto the bridge. Hey, Bob, where's my dad? she asks. Bob glances up from his book. He's still on the deck, he replies. Has he been there all night? Kim asks. Yep, Bob confirms, his eyes returning to his book. That can't be good. Maybe I should go talk to him. Bob sets down his book, turning to face her with a solemn expression. Kim, I'm not one to give advice, but in this instance, I would suggest you leave that man be until he's ready to talk with people. He has blood on his hands, and that's an evil that you don't want haunting you, my love. Trust me, the more you care for others, the more it will haunt you. And your father cares a great deal about his crew and his role as captain. It's a job he takes seriously. His warning hangs heavy in the air as Kim processes his words. You're in luck, though, Bob adds, softening his tone as he points towards the deck. Looks like he's heading this way now, Kim replies. I'm off to the sick bay. If he needs to talk, you send him there, okay? Roger that, Bob responds. As he watches Kim leave, minutes later, John steps onto the bridge, he asks Bob. Everything running smoothly. About as smooth as it gets, sir, Bob replies. Bob hesitates. So, John, I hate to ask, but at some point, others are going to inquire. Why, well, you know why you chose what you chose. John looks out over the vast open sea, the horizon sprawling endlessly before them. He takes a deep breath. Normally, I wouldn't explain myself or my actions. They should be self-evident if I made the right choice. But here, I can say he gave me his story. It sounded really good. I mean, it was convincing. A sound good story if there ever was one. We all know Jeff was a hothead and a bully. I don't doubt for a second he was telling the truth. John pauses, the memory of the decision heavy in his mind. Well, I told him I understand that I would have done the same, and it looks like you're going to be a free man. Bob stares at him, the confusion clear on his face. Then why did you kill him, John, if you thought any man might have done the same in his situation? John replied, let me finish, old friend. Then I said, but there was one more question I needed to ask before I let you go. How did you get Tony's knife? And remember... Honesty is the only reason I'm letting you go today, he told me. His cabin door was left open. I saw it, so I reached in and grabbed it for protection. Protection, you say? I asked him. He told me. And if something did go wrong, people would not point their finger at me first. I'm the new guy. I would not get a fair shake. You understand, don't you, Captain? And how did that work out for you? I asked him. Not too good, sir. At least you're a forgiving Captain, I replied. Trying to set up Tony was your fatal mistake. You could have confessed, told your story, but instead you hid the evidence and tried to frame someone else. That's the difference between self-defense and murder in my book. He forced my hand. Bob nodded in understanding. You're a far better man than I, Captain. I would have beaten him to death for such actions. Don't let this haunt you, old friend. You did the only thing you could. You can sleep sound tonight, John. Justice has been served. Bob says, and Kim said if you need to talk, she's in the med bay. That girl, I swear, we all don't wear our feelings on our sleeves like she does. I've had my talk, John replies. Then he gives Bob a reassuring pat on the shoulder as he prepares to leave the bridge. I'm getting some rest. See you in a bit, old friend. With that, John heads off, with the weight of leadership momentarily lifted by Bob's words, as Todd stood watching. Bick attached the device firmly to the bed, securing the four posts to each end. Let me show you something, he said, as he carefully held the skull above the device and gradually turned up the power. Right there, he pointed out, and as he slowly lifted the skull, the hum of the device intensified, the ropes tautened, and the bed began to rise, inching into the air ever so slowly. Bick nudged the power dial to its maximum, and the bed lifted another foot, hovering in midair. With movements of his hand forward and back, the bed mimicked his actions, responding with fluid motions before he gently set it back down, switching off the device. Todd remained speechless, lost in the moment until Bick teased, Cat got your tongue, Todd, shaking off his astonishment. Todd leaned in closer to examine the contraption. Did you feel the bed's weight at all on the skull? he asked. No, 
Bick replied, his eyes fixed on the setup. It's amazing, just amazing. I think we figured out how those silver orbs fly. Yes, but the pyramids and obelisks seem to create or harness ambient energy somehow, and the orbs tap into this energy in the ether. Somehow, it's there. We just need to access it, too, Bick mused, noticing the crystal skull faintly glowing on the desk. Picking up the skull, Todd suggested, follow me to the bridge. If I'm right, this skull will glow brighter as we get closer to a pyramid or an obelisk, or fade if we're heading in the wrong direction. It could lead us to land. With a plan forming, Bick continued, if we park near one for a few days, I might be able to figure out how to harness this power and apply it to the device. Let's go tell John. Todd and Bick burst onto the bridge. Bob was there, steering the ship. Where's John? Isn't it his turn at the helm? Bick asked, slightly out of breath. Bob shook his head. John had a tough night. He's resting. While you two were tinkering with your toys, he dealt with the aftermath of his decisions. I'd suggest letting him be until he's had his coffee. Both Todd and Bick nodded, understanding the gravity of John's situation. Eager to shift the mood, they quickly briefed Bob on their experiments with the skull and its potential to guide them to land. As hours passed, Bob kept his eyes on the horizon while the skull slowly began glowing a bright green. Suddenly Todd, peering out into the endless blue, shouted, Land! Bob carefully maneuvered closer, then cut the engines and dropped anchor. Todd noticed a cobblestone road running parallel to the shore, with a treeless coastline stretching out before them, a blank slate leading somewhere, yet nowhere. He raised the anchor, and the celeb mariner crept along the coastline, revealing a massive cove. As they entered the cove, suddenly Todd's voice cut through the quiet. I see it, a giant obelisk with a golden capstone. Bob asked in curiosity, is there a small pyramid at its base, already half standing despite the effort it took? You're not going to believe this, Bob, Todd said, handing him the binoculars. This better be good, making me stand up. Bob grumbled, taking the binoculars with a grimace. He focused them on the distant structure. That's out of place, he commented dryly. Yeah, isn't it, though? Todd replied, leaning in closer to get a better look. Bick, unable to contain his curiosity, piped up. What is it? Bob glanced at him, then back through the binoculars. It's a castle of some kind, surrounded by what looks like a star fort right on the water's edge. And those, he paused, squinting, are catapults and ballistas along the wall. Bob lowered the binoculars and returned to his seat, cutting the engines and dropping anchor once more. I think this is close enough, he declared. John stumbled onto the bridge, his expression sour. Bob, how many times are you going to drop that damn anchor while I'm sleeping? He grumbled while rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Bob looked up with a touch of shame in his eyes. Sorry, sir, but the good news is we found land. Bob adjusted the focus on the binoculars. There's another castle on the other side, Todd pointed out, directing Bob's gaze. Peering through the lenses, Bob noted the distinctive banners from each castle, flapping in the coastal breeze, one blue, one purple, echoing the flags atop each tower. Those castles are over a good mile apart, at least, Bob remarked, handing the binoculars to John. And look at that massive wall extending from the side of one of the castles running down the coastline. Between the two castles, the massive cove stretched out like a grand corridor of water, effectively serving as a gatekeeper to the sea beyond, dubbed by the crew as the Twin Peaks of Power. These imposing structures stood like a sentinel on either side of the cove. Each castle flew a distinct banner, symbolizing the unique sovereignties that controlled these bastions of power. The cove itself acted as a natural moat a strategic buffer that allowed these fortresses to control passage in and out of the region, their presence a formidable reminder of the ancient martial prowess that constructed them. John took the binoculars, his eyes narrowing as he observed the intricate architecture. Hey, Todd, grab me some coffee, would you? And don't be shy with the cream, he added with a hint of a smile. Right away, sir, Todd responded, hurrying off. As John scanned the horizon, he continued, that's definitely a castle, but there's a fifth wall running along the coast, like the cobblestone road on the other side of the cove leading to that other castle. This wall, however, has towers spaced every 200 yards or so, 
with arrow slits on both sides of the wall. Strange. Both sides, Bob interjected with a puzzled look on his face. That doesn't make sense. John chuckled dryly. If I didn't know any better, I'd say that's akin to the Great Wall of China. It has that same formidable appearance, and it stretches off into the distance, as far as the eye can see. Bick, leaning in to get a better look, added uneasily, It scares me that they think they need a wall that big and that long to protect themselves from, well, whatever it is they're protecting themselves from. Why would you need a wall that big and that long? John mused, looking at the barren land beyond the structures, only interrupted by patches of cultivated fields outside each castle. Bob then asked the crucial question, What do you want to do, John? Just then, Todd burst back onto the bridge, slightly out of breath, holding out a steaming cup. Here you go, sir. Steaming hot with three splashes. Drink it slow, he suggested. John accepted the cup with a nod. Thank you, Todd. John said, Bob, I don't see any life out there other than those crops. Not a tree in sight. Unless you want to burn your trebuchets for fuel, we might need to see if one of these castles is open to trade. Bob chuckled wryly. That hasn't gone too well for us in the past, John, you have to admit. Then let's follow the wall until we see a forest, John suggested. Bob tapped the fuel gauge a couple of times before giving John a significant look. Yeah, I see your point, but we need to think this through. Let's stay parked here, out of range of their equipment, Bob pointed out cautiously. John nodded in agreement. We send in one man, and only one. We'll draw straws. Bob, call all crew to the deck. We'll make a plan of action. As the crew gathered on the deck, John dropped a handful of straws to the ground, all but one. Holding the short straw in his hand, he announced, Wow, I'm unlucky today. I drew the short straw. Looks like I'm the one going in to negotiate. But which castle to approach is the question. The crew exchanged glances, their shock evident, yet none dared to question John's decision. Kim walks up, late as always, stepping forward, her expression stern. What's this I hear, Dad? You're going? I don't think so. Bob shook his head slightly, understanding the gravity of the situation. John, tossing back the rest of his coffee, met Kim's gaze. I can't ask someone else to do this, love. It's too dangerous. Todd intervened. John, let me do this. I'll head to the keep with the cobblestone road. It's smaller. No star fort. No obelisk. They might be more approachable. Kim nodded in agreement. Yeah, let Todd do it. John hesitated but eventually conceded. Hours later, the crew waited anxiously until, at last, Todd returned. As Kim helps Todd off the dinghy, John can't help but notice the gold he is adorned in. Todd opens up with, they were more than generous, but gold seems to be all they have to offer other than food and drink. Todd explains, handing John a hefty golden bracer. I gave them a flashlight in return for their generosity. Todd's story unfolds further. I was greeted on the beach by knights on horseback. They thought I was some kind of wizard traveling the sea alone. As I disembarked, they dismounted and kneeled before me. After a brief conversation in the sand, they escorted me to the castle, where I met the king. Todd describes the king's tale of two rival kingdoms, the other controlled by an evil wizard who has monopolized the continent's main trade route. The king explained that they are exploited by this rival, with outrageous fees, to use his trade route, and if we tried to trade with him, he would enslave us and steal our magic, the power to travel the open seas is very powerful magic. The evil wizard is not to be trusted, he said. Todd continues. The king apparently sees our seafaring ability as a formidable magic and is ready to exchange all the gold you could desire for the secret. This, Todd gestures to the gold he brought back, is just a taste of what he has to offer. He believes with this magic he wouldn't need the great trade route to protect his caravans from animal attacks and marauders. He could easily transport his goods across the sea in peace, instead of atop a fortified walled road, and not pay him for his troops to protect the caravans. John snickers. Sounds like a mafia set up. You know the mob, the syndicate or the outfit as it's called where I come from, strong arming the other nations for protection money to use his walled road. Todd remarked, Wow, you could become the richest nation on the continent fast if you controlled the only safe trade route 
with your stationed guards all along the way, ready to move to help each other at the first sign of danger. John responded thoughtfully, I don't think it's about riches, it's about power and control. The riches are just a side bonus. As John's words sank in, they stared at him with a deeper understanding, grasping the true stakes of what was being discussed. Todd says, he wants to trade for our magic, to break the chains he has on him. John, smirking slightly, listens intently. Kim, however, looks concerned. You can't do that, Dad. There are countless reasons why not. John meets her gaze firmly. I'm well aware of that, Kim. He turns back to Todd. Go and see if you can engage this so-called evil wizard that controls the other castle. He might have what we are looking for and keep that pistol out of sight. A day slipped by when Kim, with her characteristic swagger, swept onto the bridge. She distributed cups of coffee to Bob and her father, with her movements sharp and laced with impatience. Dad, I'm getting worried. When are we going to do something? She questioned. Bob took a slow sip. Kim, it's only been a day, he remarked. John lifted the binoculars to his eyes, scanning the distant shoreline. The dinghy is still on the beach. Ah, wait, there he is. He's heading back now. He lowered the binoculars. Kim, whip up some food and another cup of coffee, would you? He'll need it. Good idea, Dad, Kim replied, with her frustration easing as she turned to leave the bridge. Bob watched her go, a mischievous smile playing on his lips. He turned to John, chuckling softly. That's not right, John. John raised an eyebrow. What? You know what? Bob teased, nudging John lightly. John couldn't help but smile, acknowledging the ruse. Okay, okay, I know. Todd won't care much for the food. He'll just want to fill us in on what's happening. But it gets Kim focused on helping and gives us a moment's peace. And I don't have the nerves for her drama today. Give her a task, play on her desire to help others, and poof, she is out of our hair for a short bit. That might make me a bad dad at times, but as captain, I need to stay focused on the tasks at hand. Bob interrupts him. It's fine, old friend, I understand. I'm just giving you a hard time. As the two shared a quiet chuckle, the sound of footsteps announced Todd's return. He stepped onto the bridge, finding Bob and John caught in a hearty laugh. What did I miss? He asked with his curiosity piqued by their laughter. Just Kim, Bob quipped. John laughs once more. Todd, still puzzled, shook his head lightly. Okay. Strange. John with urgency returning to his voice, said, Did they have spare lumber to barter? Yes, they're bringing some down to the beach now as a show of good faith, Todd responded while watching John's reaction closely. What good faith? Bob interjected with a smirk. They want to know how we travel the seas. They've asked for a meeting with our great leader to negotiate trade for this magic they believe we possess, Todd explained, his tone laced with amusement. In other words, John... They want a meeting with you, Todd added. And that lumber on the beach? It's free, a sign of their friendship. Todd, go get Tony, load up the shotgun, and meet me at the dinghy. Tell Tony he's on shotgun. You two will have my back. We need to be quick, John instructed. Bob glanced over. John, you know Kim's not going to be happy about you going. Without breaking stride, John tossed over his shoulder. That's why I said we need to be quick. I'm in no mood for drama today. As they landed on the beach... They were greeted by knights, and an adorned carriage awaited. As they entered the carriage, John broached the subject. So, Todd, this wizard, Todd quickly interjected, clarifying, he's no wizard, sir. I came to the conclusion after a long conversation that his great-great-grandfather figured out how to use some of the ancient race's technology and harness the power of the obelisk to trick the people into believing he's a wizard, compelling them to do his bidding. Todd continued, The obelisk and the star fort are ancient, far older than this castle. Their family built the castle around the obelisk and the great trade route. The other king controls all the gold mines on the continent and refuses to join their coalition of nations. John absorbed the information, nodding slowly. Whatever you do, do not call him out on not being a wizard. I started to, and he got hostile, so I backed off, Todd warned. Todd explained, this cove is vast, with a large river that stretches through the continent to a mountain range, dividing the continent's people with a great canyon and river. The only safe way to trade is along the great trade route. As they approached the main courtyard, 
A figure wielding a golden scepter with a large, clear crystal atop it greeted them. The knights accompanying them knelt in unison, heads bowed in reverence. He held a device resembling a handheld calculator. As he spoke in an unrecognizable tongue, the device translated his words into English, welcoming them to his domain. I am known as the wizard Destin the Great, he proclaimed. Welcome to my humble abode, Destin said. Tony and Todd exchanged amazed glances before John responded with a respectful bow. Thank you for having us. It's an honor to meet you. The device translated smoothly, and Destin led them toward the obelisk at the heart of his fortress, standing tall. He then shared his concerns about King Boris, his rival, who wanted control over the vital trade route that passed through their lands. King Boris plans to wage war. He amasses armies, ready to disrupt our trade and bring devastation to the outer towns and villages dependent on this route. The chaos would be unimaginable, and these towns cannot sustain themselves without the trade, Destin explained. Many would die. Todd informed me on his visit with King Boris that he witnessed a significant military presence and ongoing preparations for war. What assistance do you seek from us, Destin the Great? John asked. Destin's response was unexpected. Instead of seeking their secrets, he offered them a bounty of goods and treasures merely to keep their knowledge from King Boris. As he clapped his hands, a procession of women presented a variety of exotic goods. I offer you these not for your secrets, but for your silence. My enemy must not possess your magic. I can provide you maps and safe passage through our lands, Destin proposed. John, moved by the gesture, inquired about the translating device. With a theatrical raise of his scepter, Destin commanded the skies, and lightning danced towards the obelisk, illuminating the courtyard in a spectacle of power. Moments later, women returned with a small box containing another translator and a small crystal rod. This rod holds a message for my brother Andor at the far end of the kingdom. Deliver it, and the translator is yours as payment, Destin offered. Destin shared his concerns. Your comrade Todd informed me that you possess the capability to traverse great distances swiftly, following the river that cuts through the continent to my brother Andor's keep at the other end of the kingdom. He could get word in days instead of months. That can mean the difference. He may need to send additional troops down the wall, for I fear an imminent attack by King Boris. Until Todd enlightened me, I was unaware of the magnitude of his military buildup. You have placed me in your debt by revealing this critical information. Looking at Todd, Destin explained further with a gesture towards the horizon. The wall is not designed to halt an army. Its primary purpose is merely to ward off marauders and wild animal attacks. It is crucial that my brother receives our message promptly, for the stakes are exceedingly high. For this, I shall remain indebted to you. In addition to the translator, you are welcome to fill your ship with all the supplies my kingdom can provide to aid in your journey. John accepts the offer and heads back to the ship, with the weight of the day's negotiation with the wizard lingering in his mind. Upon his arrival, he recounts everything to Bob, who raises a valid concern. We don't really know their history, John. Taking sides might not be wise, Bob cautions, ever the voice of reason. John offers a wry smile in response. I'm well aware, Bob. Just because I agree doesn't mean we'll proceed without careful consideration. We'll discuss the pros and cons. Meanwhile, Todd shuttles back and forth, filling the cargo bay with fresh provisions. As he works, Kim strides onto the deck with bravado, her presence as bold as ever, giving her father a critical gaze. So, how was the meeting, Dad? She probes. John explains the situation, and Kim's response is immediate and passionate. We have to intervene, Dad. It's not just any conflict. It's a war we could prevent. Think of the lives saved on both sides. It's not about taking sides. It's about preventing needless deaths. Bob, overhearing the exchange, can't help but admire Kim's argument. The girl makes a good point for once, he admits. John nods, yeah, but it is still taking sides. Hmm. Okay, let's do this. All right, let's move forward. Raise the anchor. Head for the river at the canyon's mouth, he commands. Bob springs into action, maneuvering the ship as John exits the bridge, yelling back, I'll be on deck, by the bow, as he grabbed the binoculars. As they approach the mouth of the river, 
John marveled at its immense size. On either side, majestic cliffs rose, framing the river with their imposing presence. On King Boris's territory, a massive watchtower loomed. Suddenly, trumpets echoed through the air, and atop the tower, a massive fire blazed into life. John's gaze followed a horseman who swiftly galloped towards King Boris's keep. His attention then shifted back to the cliff face, approximately half a mile away, where another tower lit its beacon. Makeshift fires ignited one after the other in a deliberate sequence, clearly signaling a message of urgency to the king, drawing John's deep concern as the celeb mariner sailed into the heart of the river. As the line of fires blazed, illuminating the night, John entered the bridge and turned to Bob and nodded towards the spectacle. See those fires? he asked. Bob replied, one can't help but see them. Kim, catching the look between the two men with confusion etched across her face, asked, what does that mean, Dad, sensing the gravity of the moment? John's gaze lingered out to the distant flames. It means they think we've chosen a side, love. This is not goodbye, nor the end. Until the story continues, my friends, be an rocker.